Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Welcome back to the latest edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where each week we take the pulse of the markets from the perspective of a rules-based investor. It's Alan Dunn here, sitting in for Niels, who's on his travels again. Delighted to be joined by Andrew Beer. Andrew, how are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Not at all, no. Delighted to chat. Uh, always uh, interested to hear your perspective. How are you? Uh, I, I think I saw on LinkedIn you'd, you've been doing a lot of travel of late. Well, actually, well, I was in uh, Copenhagen a month ago and then Stockholm uh, a week ago, and uh, then I go back to Copenhagen in in, uh, in in a couple of weeks. So not actually, I have to stop in Miami next week, but by 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 my standards, actually hasn't been too bad. I've been trying okay. to stick around home more. Yeah. So you're 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 back on home soil with the uh, for the election, I guess. So a lot of excitement around that. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. Uh, uh, something to talk about. Absolutely. Well, we'll we'll, we'll get we'll get to uh, all of that uh, market moving stuff in a bit. I mean, uh, we, we always kick off by asking guests uh, anything particular on your radar. So, um, what, what have you been focused on in the last few weeks that's been interesting? Well, I mean, I, I think we'll talk about the you know the ugly whipsaws that have been going on in in the, in the manner future space. Um, but no, look, I, we have the election coming up next week, and I, I wouldn't say I'm optimistic about it, um, but I'm not. I'm, I'm definitely not. I don't have the sense of hysteria that a lot of other people around me around me have about it. And and I think that you know, I think whatever happens next week, and it's likely to be. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to end on Tuesday. Like, I mean, we could be we could be talking about this stuff for a year, basically. But, but if you do, like, if you just take a step back, I mean, we are a democracy, right? People are people are fighting over votes and counting votes. We are not. There are not tanks in the streets. And so, when people get hysterical about, you know, the end of democracy, like I, I know a lot of people who've gone to serve this country in the military. I don't know a single one of them who, for for political reasons, would consider upending the constitution. Um, and so, you know, at, at, at the core, we are a prosperous country where people have a lot to lose. So I think we're going to, I think we're going to come through it. Okay. And, and there've been some editorials that have been written, uh, by somebody named Peggy Noonan at the wall street journal, who I find incredibly thoughtful, um, basically saying that, yeah, look, we, but we've been through a civil war, you know, we've been through Vietnam, we've been through, you know, many, 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 many very difficult things. Um, and, what's being sort of lost in this is, is the commonality and the general goodness and that because it's just being drowned out by these kind of two lunatic fringes on either side um but but i think we'll i think we'll i think we'll be okay good so far well that that's an optimistic perspective so we'll we'll, we'll see how it all plays out so, uh, but, by the way and if i do this as a the reason i do is if i do this as a twitter post it means like yeah, all hell's going to break loose tomorrow because I have an almost almost perfect record of of, of <laughs> calling things the wrong way when I do something. Yeah, we, we, we can fear the worst. If you are truly a contrarian indicator, then <laughs> that, that, that's a worrying <laughs> sign. But we'll see. Um, so we do have a, a question, but maybe before we get to the question, I mean, you you touched on uh, whipsaws in market. So just to to recap on CGA performance, uh, it has been a, a tricky month, Sidley. So. Um, as of the 30th of October, so that obviously excluding the last day of the month, the uh, SOCGEN CGA index was down 1.97%. SOCGEN trend was down 2.8%. And year to date, uh, SOCGEN CGA was up 0.5%. And uh, SOCGEN trend was down 0.6%. But um, yesterday was a tough day for trend followers. And it, as is always the case, the last day of the month uh, comes to, to to bite many managers, and it was definitely a, a negative day. So we will see um, more downside on the index uh, when the final numbers come through, uh, and and obviously it puts us uh, it'll probably push the CTA and the trend index into a, a negative number year to date. So it is it is turning into a a difficult year. I mean, particularly when you're considering there is 
the cushion of interest rates uh, uh, built in there. So, any thoughts on, I guess, from in terms of attribution? Obviously, at the last day of the month, there was equity reversals, but earlier in the month, we had, uh, um, you know, uh, whipsaws and fixed income. W- what's your perspective been on on the last month and uh, the last few months? Well, I think I mean I would actually I would extend it back a little bit farther, which is that I think the so so. You know, I'm always interested in kind of the shifts in narrative in this in this space, and often it kind of evolves around what's been working. And so, you know, I've, I've talked about it a little bit with Neil on these podcasts. You know, when I when we first looked at replicating the space back in 2015, 2016, I, I, it's not that it's not that trend was dead, but but people that there were commoditized products coming into trend, and so people tended to to want to emphasize things that were non-trend. Um, and yes, you know, we've talked about Winton and their push into other areas. We talked about, you know, the popularity of things like Milburn and their machine learning and counter trend things like Fort. Um, and, you know, then kind of the unexpected happened, which is in March of 2020, actually trended best. And, you know, you take a fund like PIMCO's mutual fund in the US, it, and it may have been also the rate side of it as well. They may have had some duration in it, but PIMCO does well in March. And then the trend guys, by the end of 2020 and the end of 2021, the trend guys are outperforming again. And, uh, and then 2022, obviously, that's a good, really good market for them. Trend guys do better in 2022. So by the end of 2022, I think the, you know, the general view was, okay, well, the real drive for the real source of alpha generation, I, and I believe this over time for reasons we can talk about, is medium to long-term trend. Right? If you had to identify the, the beta, the driver of returns in the space, that's that's kind of the sweet spot. And then if you look at the past 18 months or 24 months, it has been, it's as though the market gods designed a market regime to it to annoy the crap out of anybody doing medium to long-term trend because the oscillations are like are, are, are timed almost perfectly that by the time you start to love a trade, there's a, you know, there Powell opens his mouth. So if the Bank of Japan does something or you know, the Democrats do their bait and switch with, with Harris and it all of a sudden is working. And so, um, so I think, I mean, what I think this year is just has to rank among the most frustrating years and that it was working, things were working so well for a number of months. And then, I mean, thank God the, the, the industry had gains to give back. But I think, look, I think this is going to provide a lot of fodder for the, you know, just tons of investors who are broadly critical of and have this sort of deep-seated dislike of the CTA space and trend following and for, for reasons I think we can we can talk about. So uh, look, I think it's going to be, you know, certainly cause a lot of debate and it's it just, and living through it, it's just unbelievably frustrating. Yeah, you know? no, absolutely. I, I mean, it is interesting and I think about it myself, if we were to go back two years more or less to the day, um, you know, end of October 2022 or even end of September, you know, CTA, I'd say the five-year returns on the index were probably as good as they've been. Uh, and you look at the macro environment and you say, you know, inflation is back, more volatile inflation, more volatile macro conditions, rising rates, you know, perfect backdrop for CTAs and managed futures, you would say, but it just shows you how hard it is to translate a, a macro picture into um, into performance. You know, it, it's just that that performance will come when it comes. And it's... Uh, well, and it, look, and, know, and one, one of the great things about the space is they get out, right? They don't hold things with a white knuckle grip. And, and, and there's, you know, there's a coldness and a rationality to it. If it's not working, you know, don't pretend the markets are wrong. Just, you know, listen to the markets, but because of the nature of the oscillations it's, you know, so I, I was writing about, you know, how we were positioned in July about being long the Trump trade and, you know, and you get to kind of the middle of July and the guy survived an assassination attempt, think that people think it's going to be a red wave and they think it's going to have three impacts on the market. It's going to be good for equities. It's going to be bad for bonds because, you know, because of uh, tariffs and, you know, and, and uh, deficits and everything else. Uh, and it'll be good for the dollar, um, you know, taken together. And God, I wish we'd held those positions. <laughs> it's like, like, because looking at the markets today, you're like, oh, you were so right, right? You had it. It was, and the, the market was telling you exactly what was going to happen. And then there were these like, you know, crazy macroeconomic variables. Like, you know, nobody on planet Earth thought after that, they thought Biden was going to stay in the race because he had this white knuckle grip on the race. And then, and then they swap out Harris. Nobody thinks that's going to work well. And then it works better than anybody expected. And then the Bank of Japan comes in and decides, there's this great uh, quote on Zero Hedge, which 
um, where talking about the Bank of Japan, they said, if, you know, whatever is the worst possible decision that you can make at the worst possible time, <laughs> they're going to do it. And so, you know, so they basically like set the macro world on fire for a couple of weeks, you know, and then the economic data came in weaker. So it was just like, it was just, and, and all of those were turned out to be head fakes. Um, but, but as you know, but you, when you're on the market and you're on the wrong side of it, it's just, it is so frustrating. Yeah. No, it's ahead. It has. You're right. It has been choppy. I suppose if you, as you say, if you went back to July, you had a Trump trade. We went and you had fears of recession on another months, and it's longer. You know, so you've had that kind of uh, off in in the narrative. But you know, but I actually so add one thing to that, which is that you know we're we're all very narrowly focused on how annoying it is in the managed future space and the CTA space. Imagine if you've made big bets on bonds, right? I mean. I mean, talk about guys there who in early 2020, I mean, it's, it was early 2023. It was, this is going to be the year of the bond, you know, rates are going to go down here, then rates go up for a period of time. Then SVP happens and rates are going down, but for the wrong reasons, because we think we're going to have a global banking crisis. Then rates come climbing, then climbing back up again, you're underperforming cash again. So it's not, it's not isolated to this space, um, but it, it, but but you know, we feel we we feel the sting on our cheeks a little more than than other people do. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly do. I mean, I mean, it is as we've said many times. It's not the easiest strategy to hold, and this is uh, another year that has definitely proven that to, to be the case. So moving on, um, I know. I mean, you did mention you were on your travels in Europe, uh, in Copenhagen, and in Sweden. I think you said, and uh, I know you participated in in in, in a, an interesting roundtable with uh, all the the, the great uh, uh, thinkers in the managed uh, future space. So, uh, tell us about about that. Was there any any notable uh, insights coming out of that? Well, I think look, first of all, I was I was incredibly grateful to be invited um, I just, um, because. Just, for our audience, that it was the Hedge Nordic event, is that it? Right, and yeah, so Hedge, Hedge Nordic, and apparently, and, and I was learning this as I went because I'm always kind of, you know, trying to catch up with everybody else. Um, but uh, but apparently, every year Hedge Nordic has done these great roundtables where they assemble these luminaries of the industry and they talk about things that are going on and, and broad industry trends. And you know, and being as typically uninformed and out of the loop as I am, uh, I I uh, you know I, I anyway I got invited to this, and it was interesting in that. So you did have, um, you know, luminaries there from uh, Lynx, the the local hometown hero in Stockholm. Uh, Katie Kaminsky was there from Alpha Simplex. You know, Aspect was there, Transtrend was there, and then also you had a, some ETF people. Like so, I was there, and and Jerry Parker was there, and 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 a couple of other people. And like it was just, it was really interesting. First of all, everyone was incredibly nice and incredibly gracious. I felt a little bit like I kept making these kind of jokes about like having my back to the wall and stuff like that. And it, I, think, I think they all kind of fell flat. I think they're like, you know, please stop. Um, but um, it confirmed a lot of the research that I've done about the architecture of the space, which is that, that, that the big players in this space are in a very, very privileged position in that they have great longstanding relationships with very serious, very sophisticated investors. Um, and, and their businesses and, and somebody, I mean, this is no one from man group was there, but I have a friend of mine who's very senior at man. And, and he was describing to me about a year ago, he said, you cannot believe how much of our business is solutions based, you know, that we have, because, and, and I think, look, I think the reality, if you sit back coldly and you say, you know, what's going to work well over the next three years, is it alternative markets versus traditional markets, short-term versus long-term um, you know, are there other statistical things you can you can layer into it? It's really impossible to make to to, to feel like you have a, an edge in making that call. So, what I think the industry has has largely evolved to is that we have these sophisticated investors who see the value of the strategy, and ultimately they want to work with people who are both asset managers but also solutions providers. To help them to that they have ideas in terms of the exposures that they want to get, the research that they want to get, and I use an example actually of uh, in it about Bridgewater, in that you know in one of the ways that Bridgewater was able to develop such strong relationships with CIOs of pension plans all over the U.S. and sovereign wealth funds, etc., was that they had a huge part of their business that was purely about providing research and supporting these people, and so. You know, so so going into it, my my view was that there is this 
loyal, stable core of institutional allocators. And, you know, in hedge fund world, you'd say it's about 300 billion in assets. And, and maybe you get into more of it when you, when you layer other, other things into it. But, but there's a very, very powerful relationship and dynamic that often goes back a decade or more. And that's really, and I said, that's really valuable because the person sitting on the other side of the table, the person who's making the allocation decision, they have their own job to do. And they have their own committee to serve, their own messaging around it. And in a sense, there's this very um, symbiotic relationship around it. Um, you know, on my part, I try to do the same thing, but to the rest of the world. Um, and in that, you know, when I'm talking about what we're doing on the replication side, it's very specific around the feedback that I've gotten from people about things that they're trying to solve in their portfolios. Now we're not, we're not trying to solve it for people necessarily on a investor by investor basis, but if 30% of model allocators say I can get them to open up and talk about what they want and they say, boy, I really wish we had something that could do this. Then that gives me somewhat of a window that given the, the, the heterogeneity of the investor base, everybody's got different, different constraints, different criteria, et cetera, that, um, you know, that to try to be very targeted about how we can build something that meets the needs of a particular constituent within it. Um, and that's, and that's why like all the discussion about like cannibalization and everyone always asks these questions, like, you know, what if you take over the industry and like, there's no in, in indices to replicate or whatever. I, it's always kind of an absurd question to me because if, if the whole metric was, is it better to own the S and P 500 versus a taking a shot at picking a long only active managers, you would have picked the S and P 500 20 years ago, but, but people don't, right. They want to talk to people who are picking stocks. They want to understand what they're doing. They like, they like, like the insights that they glean. Um, it's often part of their job description is to find that. So Anyways, I found I found it I found it unbelievably interesting, and and then I've, of course I was going all over Stockholm meeting investors, which which was you know seeing the other side of this as well. Interesting. I mean, what you talk about in terms of those deep relationships, obviously that I mean you're alluding to largely the institutional space, and then obviously, I mean I guess a lot of people in allocating to ETFs are either in the model portfolios phase or they might be in private wealth. Uh, so I, I guess you do have that market segmentation. It's not fair to say that different CJs might be serving different, or at least stronger in, in serving different uh, particular segments of, of the uh, investor base. Again, having gone around and seen a number of institutional wealth management investors, like guys, like everybody's really different, right? I mean, if, if you invested in a manager, you had a bad experience with it three years ago, and, and the decision was to get out of the space entirely, your view is going to be completely different than the guys, I mean, who have taken it like the strategy, but internalized it, who, or people who have gone down the path of doing QIS and other, other kinds of products. So I think the, I think the, at least from, from my perspective, and you know, we kind of talk about kind of the, the whole narrative side of it is over the years, I think I've gotten a clearer sense as to who is the potential constituent for it. And the bottom line is not about incremental sharp ratio. It's often not even really bad. Like there, there are things that people throw out about it, but it's, it's, do I make your life better? Right. And, and actually I use this example where one of the firms in the room, um, an in current investor with them had come in to see us. And, and I got to the end of the meeting with them. I said, honestly, I think you have the right pick for you. The way you're set up, like I, whether these guys have a, their sharp ratio is 0.1 higher or 0.2 higher, or they go through a, a particular drawdown or something in the context of the way you guys are set up, the, the messaging that you've received from them is totally consistent with how you're trying to build, build your portfolio. And at the end of the meeting, I actually said, like, I don't think we help you. I like, I don't, I don't think you're going to look back and say, you know, I don't think in your particular job configuration that you're going to come back and say, that you're going to be rewarded because 50 basis points or 1% of your portfolio was a little bit cheaper and a little bit easier to invest in. <laughs> like, like, like whatever the things that, that might, down there that, that might get a guy who's managing a wealth management portfolio in the U S you know, under certain regulatory extent, that might get him very excited. So it's, well, it's I guess, uh, I mean, I guess that just reflects how the, the industry has evolved and we'll talk a, a bit more about this later, but obviously we have now, you know, you have, 
at the one extreme, you have the solutions and then you have, you know, standardized hedge fund products and you have mutual fund products and now you have ETF products. So they are, they are all different representations of trend following managed future strategies aimed at different uh, segments of the market f- and, and serving different needs. And, and, and I guess differences are, are driven by, by the requirements of, of the end investors, which is, I guess, fair enough, no? Well, sure, but I mean, but this, I mean, no one would care if the space was growing. The elephant in the room is the space hasn't grown on on the hedge fund side and the mutual fund side in a decade, basically. And so, it, I've described this as a, it's a great sort of a Hunger Games mentality that there's a finite pool of assets out there. We know who's got the money, and so how do we, you know, we'll go in smiling, but we're trying to bump somebody else out. And my broader thing is I think that's self-destructive to growth in the space. It, it, it's the right thing to do when you're sitting in front of the client because that's a your only chance is to convince that you're doing something better than the next guy. But I think what it does is it gets people to focus, at least outside of that group, it gets people to focus on um, uh, the relatively slight differences between these portfolios over time compared to the underlying drivers, as opposed to helping people to understand what, how would you visualize a good experience of owning this five years from now? It's where everybody's energy is right now, you know, is, is, and you know, how do we get onto that? Even in in the mutual fund space, you know, how do we get our, our fund onto that platform? And then how do we unleash an army? And if we're going through a period of outperformance, how do we kind of pitch and sell that? I don't find it terribly e- effective um, because because ultimately the decision that people are going to make about it is is you don't know if gonna, what decisions they're going to make unless you really understand what they're really thinking and as opposed to what people say when like I mean you, people walk into the room they say I want the best manager with the lowest fees the highest sharp ratio that does the best in a crisis that does well during other periods of time right I mean they, they and not only does that not exist. But it's also not really what makes a difference then. You know, what, what's going to make much, a much bigger difference is, you know, and, and people talk about it in somewhat condescendingly in terms of like career risk and other things like that. I, I, but it's not, it's not that. I mean, people have, there's always this expectation from the outside that a fund manager is pulling the wool over the eyes of their investors, you know, and, and so it, one example was, is private equity. And so, when 2022 happens, a lot of private equity funds didn't really mark down. You have VC funds who were marking down their portfolios, and, and a lot of journalists were in an uproar about, you know, ah, you know, they're this is a, you know, they're 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 deceiving their investors. And and I, I kind of grew up with people in that world. So I called some senior guys in it. And I said, guys, like, help me out here. Like, you know, like how do you feel? I mean, do you feel like you are not being sufficiently aggressive and marking things down? And they said, it's a thing clients love most about it. Yes, the volatility <laughs> right, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, because <laughs> because they're walking in, they're getting off the phone with us and walking into a meeting with their investing committee, who sees, you know, fire, fires spreading in other parts of their portfolio, and they're not really in a mood to ask really hard questions about whether we're not marking this down sufficiently or not. Um, and so, so I think I think it's that I think it, it's it's just sort of starting with an appreciation that allocators and, and and people who run funds, if you have relationships that are sort of open and candid, you can have a much more, I think, efficient and productive relationship. Um, and and, and it, 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 I think it ends up working better for anybody. I think the problem is that a lot of the distribution business is designed to, um, you know, particularly in, in, like marketing managed futures funds, et cetera, it's, it's often designed around slipping a fast one by the investor. You know, like, oh, we've gone through six months of outperformance. It wasn't luck. It was, you know, that we knew that we should be, you know, overweight or underweight X, Y, Z. And, 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 and there's this huge incentive for people to kind of push it to get people into it because that's how they're going to get paid. And then invariably it doesn't. And then that's when you get pissed off investors and, Space doesn't grow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody has narratives and, and I, I guess people have to think about how they position products. And I think you're right up to a point. I mean, if some, if a manager, 
makes a change to their system and then suddenly has better performance. You know, obviously it's probably more likely to be random, but the narrative that they made a change, it's working, tends to resonate better with, with investors, I would say. So there's always a temptation to pull on that. But uh but yeah, equally, I mean, at, but that's but that's also legitimate as well, right? I mean it's not it's it's not I mean like we people think we are very strange for being proud of not changing what we do in eight plus years. Again, just going back to the heterogeneity of the investor base, right? There are people who, even if they buy into it, right? I'm not sure they know how to explain it to people because like, so, so here's interesting. So we have, you know, we, as you know, we manage an ETF in the U S right. You can have a conversation with an institutional consulting firm about, and the first five minutes before we get into it will be, you know, it's such a pain in the ass to invest in hedge funds. We wish we could invest in, 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 in you know, an easier vehicle. We're getting a lot of pressure from, from our clients on fees. You know, we wish there were lower cost ways of investing. Our clients really value liquidity and, you know, and wouldn't it be great to integrate? I mean, they kind of like describe all the things that we've tried to solve and they may eventually, but in general, the reason they would never invest in an ETF is because they're not going to have hedge fund, hedge fund, hedge fund, hedge fund, ETF, hedge fund, hedge fund, hedge fund in a category on a, on a reporting statement. It's because it's the hedge fund bucket. And again, going back to my point is that I don't think they're doing anything wrong but by, by, by with their clients because their clients have hired them because they built hedge fund buckets. If, and if the client hires them and says, you know, we want a hybrid, find us, you know, whatever, do these optimization, optimization around it. But, but that's not, that's not what they've been asked to do. And, and I, so I think understanding that and being able to have open conversations about those kinds of constraints like that is it, it'll make the, I think it, what's well, my goal is to make the whole distribution process much more efficient because I don't want to waste other people. I don't want to waste their time. And I don't think, uh, I don't want them to waste my time if, 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 if we're not going to do something that's going to make their lives better, how they define it. Let's pause there for a second. I'm, I did have a question um, that I should have addressed a moment ago, but let, let, cause it's not, um, I mean, it, it, it is related to this topic in the sense of we're talking about different products for, um, different market segments. And, and uh, one the, the question is around um, the use of capital guaranteed products, which is another segment of the market that used to be uh, very much to the fore. So if you go back in time, I guess maybe, what, probably 15, 20 years ago, uh, I think MAN uh, AHL used to have a big business where their trend program was wrapped in a, in a capital guaranteed product. And the way it worked was you bought, uh, I mean, you took kind of, 80% of the, of the value of the uh, of your investment and bought a zero coupon bond and then the rest was uh, spent on an option uh, basically to track the performance. It can track anything, obviously, but it used to be to track the performance of CTA performance. So the question is around, you know, where have these products gone? Obviously, with higher interest, with lower interest rates, they didn't work, you know, so they were gone for a decade. Obviously, rates have shot up again in 2022. It's still really reasonably high, so it would work. But I haven't seen this type of product in the market myself. Have you experience of it or any reason why we haven't seen a resurgence of this type of uh, capital guaranteed product in particular well, you, with respect to CTAs? Yeah, I mean, how much, I mean, do you know how much of that was in the US versus abroad? It was more in the UK as far as I know. UK, yeah. okay. Yeah. I, don't know, I don't know the UK market as it relates to this. Um, uh, well, I'll tell you, in the US, um, so we are, what we do, as you can imagine, is extremely capital efficient. So I spent maybe two plus years, maybe three years, um, trying to figure out, this is when interest rates were a lot lower, to try to figure out whether we could basically do something in a principal protected note. Um, and the people that we were talking to were insurance companies in the US. Um, and the argument was that if it was principal protected, then they could treat it as a bond and therefore it would end up in their gazillions of dollars of bonds as opposed to it being a standalone on a hedge fund basis. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so all of these things, I usually have, there's some motivation behind why they do it. Like I've heard of people doing principal protected things in Latin America, uh, to high net worth families, but there it's more of like, 
don't worry, you can't lose your money and we're going to swing for the fences with this other part. So, er, 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 so, so I don't know all these different markets. What I do know is in this market, um, the regulatory regime shifted in that the self-regulatory organizations at some point decided that this wasn't really a bond. This was a zero coupon bond plus a hedge fund strategy. <laughs> and, and so that had accounting and other treatments. And, uh, and like people were trying to put private equity. It's like, I mean, you know, once, once there's an opportunity, people try to find as many ways to do it. So I don't know what's happened since rates have come back up. But, but my sense was that there was, um, you know, that the, the obvious buyer of the insurance company that wants to get a different kind of exposure, um, was gone for regulatory and accounting reasons. But broader, I agree with you. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it as much yeah. as well outside. Uh, of it. I just know from from kind of an Irish UK context that they were more of a feature in the past and less so lately. I mean, I think some of it is regulatory as well in relation to even though it's a capital guaranteed product. In terms of if you want to sell that to retail, I'm not sure it's still regarded as it's still regarded as complex because the underlying investment is is seen as complex. So I think that that is one angle to it, but. I understand. And also, the- also, like in in the wealth management, like in, I mean, at, from what little I know of the products that are sold in Latin America, um, I mean, they are loaded with fees, right? And so you're basically nobody's spending a lot of time analyzing the all in cost of these things. So they can charge huge commissions on it. So you know, I, they don't have a a wonderful connotation um, uh, for people who you know who who kind of care about 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 those things like that, but. But no, look, I, I haven't seen it. And I also don't know. There has also just been a huge problem in that I think after years and years and years of low interest rates, no one wants to give up their coupon. Like that three, four, five, whatever, 5% coupon. It like, like if you look at like, so we also have, have products that are in, you know, what do you call sort of the multi-strat usage space. And those products, you know, by and large have been losing a lot of assets for years because, and, and even in 2023, like after having done well in 2022, You'd think, oh my God, you know, given how much bonds went down. But by the time early 2023 rolled around, I mean, we just heard it from wealth manager after wealth manager. It's why would I do anything but buy short term gilts? And, um, you know, I don't want duration risk. I'm just, it's like, so there's almost like this palpable relief of getting coupons again. Um, so again, maybe so you go to a zero coupon structure. Yes. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that in, in, in structured products world that had been very popular particularly when rates were low, was uh, what are called auto-callable. So basically selling selling volatility and betting that, you know, certain ba- certain stocks or baskets of stocks wouldn't trade below a certain level. But I, I think those have remained popular even as rates have come up because then your your total return is even higher now. So it is, it is curious. We haven't seen more of this, but I think regulatory issues is one thing. And as you say, interest rates. What people have also done is like the bigger institutions have unpacked it, right? So they're saying they're going to the guys I was in the room with, presumably, and saying, you know, we want to do 300 million, but we want to put up 100 million of, uh, uh, you know, we want to manage the bond portfolio. We want to manage the collateral. We're going to, um, and so you're you're basically getting to the same place just without the fiction of this being a stapled bond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right. And, and I mean, the part of the question was then, uh, are the return stack products kind of delivering this without the guarantee? I mean, I mean, basically, all of these kind of products are using different uh, constituent parts. So, in some cases, it's it's a bond and an option, or in other cases, it's it's a bond and and futures trading. So, it is it they are all different representations of um, combining different uh, financial instruments. So, maybe moving on, um, I know you wanted to talk about uh, ETF performance a little bit, and 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 maybe the challenge for for, for certain CTAs of given that you know. As the market has evolved, now we have mutual funds and ETFs uh, competing side by side, and and in some cases, some providers have, have both types of products in in, in the market. Um, what, what was uh, what was your perspective on this that, that you wanted to, to talk about? Well, uh, so I think um, I, I one of the I actually did a LinkedIn post on this about a week ago. Um, basically, like there there is this self serving assumption that that. You know, hedge funds are these magical alpha generation machines that you know you should be more than happy to go through the headache. Like, I mean, look, I mean, let's use the most obvious example, like a millennium, right? 
thing that those guys have done a sharp ratio of two plus for 30 years. They have skated through the craziest <laughs> macro shifts in the past five years and not a scratch on their car. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I mean, unbelievable. And they charge you an absolute fortune. And, you know, if you can give them money, just give them money and, you know, hope some something catastrophic doesn't happen. So there's this, there's this kind of perception that, you know, that's what a hedge fund is, right? And then then there was the whole ghost of this liquid alts world. And liquid alts world, a lot of the products have been really bad in liquid alts land. I mean, if you look at the broad liquid alts space, and I, I, you know, I said this basically, like if you want to evaluate a space, dig up all the dead bodies, right? When, when people look at the space, they tend to say, you know, who's there today? Who are the five largest guys? How they've done? And, you know, for ease and social validation and career risk and everything else, they'll pick one of the five. Probably not the best because he might be a little bit too crazy, probably not the worst, but one of the, one of the, you know, two, three or four is probably going to get the allocation. So a lot of the liquid alts world broadly um, has a bad connotation um, because they're generally being offered by traditional asset management firms who have a, they're sitting on this big, gigantic melting ice cube of their traditional active management business. And if you talk to them, honestly, they're like, yeah, in 30 years, it's going away. So what do we do between now and then? So, so they, they, but they have these big existing distribution forces. And so, you know, starting right after the GFC, they start taking hedge fund products and putting them into these things, not really more about pushing products out the door. And then, and there's a, a guy named Ben Johnson at Morningstar who has this great expression called the spaghetti cannon, right? If you, if you shoot enough spaghetti at the wall, a couple pieces will stick. And so, you know, so, and Morningstar studied this as well. Like, you know, you might have a firm that's got 12 products out there, not their best, not their favorite, not their high conviction, 12. Okay. <laughs> and so, so. And the one of the ways you 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 keep you feed your large army of distribution people is there's always a winner in those twelve. There's always something that looks good, and so they're and because they are higher cost products, they might be two hundred basis points on average. Uh, even in the managed future space, it's one hundred and seventy basis points on average on the, for mutual funds. Um, that allows you to pay your sales guys a lot more, and so. So their motivation, this army of people, their motivation is to stuff as much of this product as, as fast as they can during a good period. And, you know, and again, you're, they're usually coming from very big, reputable brand name firms, lots of resources, et cetera, et cetera, buying them. So they're very effective at doing it. The problem is that they're not that worried about how investors are going to be in, feeling in three years or five years if it doesn't work. So you look at this broad liquid alts world, and, and by that I mean mutual funds and, and usage funds. And, and Wilshire has good data on this. Like you're talking like a 2% return over a decade. Right? So maybe less than bonds over that period of time, and but after like 200 basis points in fees, and generally with a very high correlation to equities. So it, it, you know, I've called it a failed experiment um, or, or, or a great embarrassment for the asset management industry, but but what it did is it kind of fed into this narrative of, ah, the reason was because they're mutual funds. It was a mistake to go look for liquidity as opposed to taking a step back and saying, no, people who don't really know what they're doing are shoving products into the market to, to try to make a quick buck, which is basically what happened. You know, and then when you step down to ETFs, the knock on ETFs, again, in the standard hedge fund framework was Bill Ackman is not doing an ETF. I, of course, at the moment I say that, of course, he's probably going to launch one tomorrow, but 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 again, I mean, it was you know you like if you if you take an activist position where you can't sell your stocks for a period of time, you cannot have an ETF. You know, having to sell your position because you're, because you're an ETF, the transparency of the positions, the fact you could see every day what whether somebody is buying or selling stocks, um, the limitations. So there are all sorts of limitations that you actually do run into. Um, so that standard model, hedge fund better than mutual funds. If you know, I'll, I'll hold my nose. If I can't invest in the hedge funds, I'll hold my nose and invest in the mutual fund or, or use its version of it. Then the assumption was always when you could never make it work at an ETF. And look, my, my contention is that that's wrong as it relates to the managed future space. Um, Millennium is never doing a mutual fund. They're never doing an ETF. I get it. But by and large, there's not a lot of evidence that wildly more complexity 
meaningfully improve Sharpe's ratios in the space. You don't have the position level transparency issues of, now granted, if you're man HL and you're doing an ETF and somebody can calculate exactly how much of the heating oil market you represent or something, okay, that gets a little bit scary for a front running perspective. But so I don't think that relationship holds in CTA land. And there, and there, there are specific examples of it, like there are one-off examples. I, I wrote a, a post about a, a, a fund run by Simplify Asset Management called CTA. I have no idea what CTA does on a daily basis. All I know is they're, they seem to be killing it. They're killing it this year. Like everyone goes down one day, they seem to be going up. So they're doing something that's very, very different and idiosyncratic. The only point is like, sure, you've got an ETF that is doing really, really well relative to the very best guys in the world have been doing this for a very long time, running big hedge funds, doing it. You know, that even in the drawdown recently, uh, like, uh, uh, you know, Katie Kaminsky and Alpha Simplex launched an ETF. Look at that number since it was launched. It's great. I forgot, I've, I've had the, uh, what this, I think since it launched, the, the CTH, uh, Sasha and CTH trend index is down 11. They're down four, right? So again, the perception that, oh, it's in an ETF, and therefore it doesn't have all, maybe it doesn't have all the risk controls that you would have in other kinds of products. It's so it, it's just all about it's, but, but people hold on to these things. They hold on to these cannons sometimes because they're self-serving sometimes because they're just anchored to it. Um, and sometimes because they just, they sort of like the pitch. They like the narrative. Well, I think that's definitely is. I mean, if you take man, for example, as you say, man, have an ETF and a mutual fund, and obviously they have hedge funds and a solutions business. No, their their ETF trades at a higher vol, as far as I understand it, yeah, a, a decent bit more than their mutual fund. But I mean, their expectation would be that their mutual fund would have a higher sharp uh, than their. Uh, and I'm I'm this what I'm assuming. I'm not speaking on their behalf, but I'm assuming based on the fact that it's pure. Um, I mean, you, you they expect a higher sharp because you've got trend and other strategies and trading more markets, so that should. All else being equal, equal a higher sharp. That that that's the general argument. No, and um, look, it, actually, so I mean, so first of all, I mean, I mean, just for the record, I think their mutual fund is fantastic. All right, I mean, it's it's I'd like if I mean, people have asked me if you could invest in one mutual fund in the space. Uh, if I'm an allocator, I'm picking that fund, um, in part because I think it does. It's like first of all, just in terms of who they are, the brand name, the gravitas. Um, uh, you, they're, they're, they're the best or they're, you know, they're at, at the very, very top tier, but also, um, I think they know what the mission is of that fund. I'm guessing that uh, uh, you know, these guys better than I do. I think they know the mission of this fund is to provide a single fund, a single line item that's going to be sufficiently diversified. It's going to look a lot like the whole industry, but they're going to dial up their risk controls a little bit more to be a little bit better at the inflection points. And so, I mean, they were, where's my number? I don't know. They were through last month. They were down two last month, um, which, and again, they're not having a great year, but I didn't look at their, their, their ETF, but their ETF is more of a wild animal, right? And I think they're, and look, I think they're making a conscious decision. They want to have a toe in the ETF world, but, but they've got to make it sufficiently different that you it's, and, and, and look, and, and they have out, look, they've had better drawdown characteristics and slightly outperformed the ETF since it was launched, I would be surprised if that ETF became a, 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 a dominant ETF over the, over the last five years. I don't think it was really designed. I think if they designed something that looked more like their mutual fund, but put it into, in, into an ETF, it would be more directly competitive with the mutual fund, but it would also have broader appeal. But again, the moment I say that, I'll be wrong. I suppose, I mean, one thing to address, I mean, you're talking about performance and performance years today, are, you know, I mean, if we're talking about these types of strategies, which are, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 sharp or something like that. I mean, if you believe that the sharp, say from a mutual fund is 0.1 or 0.2 sharp more than say from an ETF, to actually prove that, I think you need, I don't know the exact number, but I think it's 10 years of data or something like that. It's not one year, it's not six months. So nobody has 10 years because these products have just been launched. So, I mean, ultimately, I know we talked a bit about narratives earlier, but I think that's why the narratives are important because, okay, obviously, track record is important, performance sets are important, but I think you have to look beyond the, 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 the track record, given the, the, the randomness in the numbers and the fact that to, to prove anything definitively, you need very long time series. 
So, I mean, that's why I think that the well, narrative okay, but you, becomes but, but, quite but important. You, you can compare hedge funds and mutual funds, right? You can. You can compare that, right? Yeah, We've yeah, had a yeah. lot of data on mutual yeah, funds yeah, yeah. For, sure. for 10 plus years. But, right? but then it's different types of mutual, uh, mutual funds and hedge it's, funds. It's yeah. never going to be... You know, Perfect, a, a yeah. honey crisp apple versus a honey crisp apple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay. yeah I get. You're, if you're lucky, it's honey crisp versus Granny, you know, Granny Smith. <laughs> but more likely, it's apples versus oranges. So, so what do we know about? Well, obviously, we've looked a lot at this data because it's it's a source of daily data on hedge funds. Um, so, you know, what you see is that you take the Morningstar U.S. trend systematic category, you compare it to the Sockgen CTA index. And they have a 98% correlation to each other. They offer nearly identical performance in the vast majority of the time. With the exception is the vols in the vol is a little bit lower in the mutual fund. There do appear to be on the average of mutual funds, a few more constraints into it. So instead of going up 20 net, which the Sogen CTA index did, remember, if, and if it goes up 20 net, it went up 26, basically. So, and the mutual funds after 200, 170 basis points go up 14. So you lost something. You lost 10 points because of your vol controls over that period of time. The rest of the time, they're almost indis indis indistinguishable. So we do actually know that you can run these things. You can deliver, you know, relatively comparable results. But again, you, you have to make a calculation. How much is losing that 10 points of returns in 2022? That's you know, you spread that over five years, it's 200 basis points of, of underperformance. Exactly. And I mean, for some investors, that is valuable to get that higher vol and that, that justifies going the, the more aggressive route. Absolutely. And that's, and that's why, and so people, you know, a criticism of what we do, since we're trying to replicate pre incentive returns is we're, we're, we're more volatile, but I believe not to the, maybe to the tune of what man is doing with AHLT, their, their ETF, but I believe that actually I think investors can stomach more volatility to a certain point. Within this, obviously, we've had, as you say, we've had uh, hedge funds and mutual funds and ETFs. And obviously, within ETFs, we have replicator ETFs. So now we're seeing more and more replicator ETFs. We've got, you see yourself as you were the, probably the first or one of the first and, and the most well-known in the managed future space. But as you say, Alpha Simplex have a product and um, return stacking um, guys, Corey and team Corey, have, yep. uh, have have kind of uh, various uh, representations of that. I mean, do you think we'll see more replicators? Do you think the replicating space will get competitive and people start saying who's a better replicator? Is that going to be the part of the next evolution of the industry? Sure, think? there already is. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, so, so look, I mean, uh, you know, Bob Elliott Unlimited launched a Managed Futures ETF, I don't know what they're... Again, look, I, to be clear, I'm very good friends with Corey Hofstein. I'm very good friends with Katie Kaminsky. I am not sitting with them at the desk as they are, you know, doing what they're doing. So so I have, I mean, I'm always one step removed. So, you know, the bet that we made was that, again, I, I come at this not as a quant, right? I didn't, I, I didn't, I got out of business school I go work for a value-based hedge fund guy. I go off and start a commodity-focused, a fundamentally-driven commodity-focused, um, you know, multi-manager fund. I, I, I was a relative value fund, and like it's not. I didn't come at this as a quant. I came at it because I, I loved the nature of it from an investment perspective. And this is the way I, I also did a LinkedIn post on this. Uh, by the way, I, I do all my LinkedIn posts when I'm traveling, apparently because I'm bored and lonely. And so, I, <laughs> so but, but I did a LinkedIn post on this with basically, um, you know, Roger Federer gave this great speech about, and he started off as a commencement speech over the summer. And he basically said, you know, something, so he says something to the fact of like, I lost 47% of the points that I played. Points, yes. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, then he described how, Winning fifty three percent of points translates into sixty something percent of games. Translates into you know eighty percent. Translates into ninety percent of, of of matches. And what I always loved about the idea of replication is that if you think you're accurate enough with a structural arbitrage, and you can win, because again, we are making one week bets that what we dis discern to be the broad factor positioning of the space on Monday afternoon will be sufficiently accurate, and it turns out over on using monthly data, it's about a 90% correlation, sufficiently accurate over the course of next week that will be close, will get it directionally right, 
but the structural efficiencies around around trading costs and fees, um, it gives us a slight edge. Right. So if you look at the weekly data, we outperform somewhere between fifty three and fifty four percent of the time, with a very very slightly positive skew. Okay. So that's a poker player, right? Who walks into a casino and knows I'm going to lose a ton of games. I mean, I would lose a ton of hands. But if I can stay there and have, or, you know, people say, if you have enough at bats, it works. So that you translate it over a month and you get into the 60s. You translate it over a quarter, you're in the 70s. You translate it over a year, you're in the 80, 80%. Right. So, so as an investor, you know, as somebody like if you say, he, you know, he's a trader who wins 55% of the time, he's an all star, right? It's like your Stevie Cohen kind of like, like, like category. So that's basically what we ended up doing. Now, when people come to, and there is, by the way, another firm who copies us very, very, very closely, but they add in all sorts of artificial intelligence and other things like that. Um, but like in the case of Corey, in the case of Katie, they looked at it and I think, and look, I don't think it's hard to conclude that it works, right? You can, you can nitpick at the margin, but it is in a sense designed to be this, this, this adaptive, repeatable process. Right? What are you looking for? You're looking for you're looking for an, an adaptable, repeatable investment process that generates excess returns. And that's what I found compelling about it. Um, uh, without writing a line of code. Um, so, but uh, so yeah. So the question was then the difference. The differentiator is there just one? Obviously, there's a couple of ways. Right. Of so replicating. So, yeah. Right. So so what they do is they say, okay, well that's great, but it's incomplete. You know, wouldn't I rather, if I know that what most people are doing is looking at, you know, 150 days versus 20 day windows, and I can add in more instruments and I can do other things like that. Now, the process I'm sure they go through is they say, what if I have been doing it for this past 10 years? What if I combine that with this replication that I'm now saying, what if I've been doing that for the past 10 years, the top down replication, and I combine it and it probably shows them better results. And so then they implement it. But there's also probably a commercial consideration. You know, it's a little hard to exactly copy the guys who've kind of invented the space. You know, why would you do that? Now, if BlackRock did it, if Vanguard did it, their presence, their brand name, et cetera, would overwhelm anything else. Who cares if they haven't been doing it? It's BlackRock. <laughs> they charge them 10 basis points. Who cares? Right. But but for most other people, they themselves have to tell a story about differentiating from what we're doing. Otherwise, because, you know, I always used to say this, when we, when we got into the, to the business, I always liked trying to be a first mover. So I was a first mover in the commodity space. I was a first mover in, 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 in greater China hedge funds. Because when second movers come into the space, they first have to sell you. They sell the idea. They say, that was such a good idea. We're going to do it ourselves and we're going to make it slightly better in the following way. And, and, and again, as I've you know, always said, the issue here is not relative market share, whether we get X percent, somebody else gets X percent. The issue is, can we grow the pie 20 X or 50 X? Um, and so, uh, so look, as I've said with that, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have them in, in, in the space. Um, uh, there's a, you know, again, there's another firm out there. So yeah, I think, I think I'm sure state street will probably jump into it at some point. Bob Elliott will do it. And I think what you'll see in five years is that replication will just be a tool in the same way that QIS products are a tool. Um, and it could be delivered in QIS products in a sense, you know, Sockchain's decision to launch, launch this index is essentially building a QIS product around what historically had been an active strategy or care framed as an active strategy. But it, but again, it, it just is, as we talk about kind of the heterogeneity of investors, it's trying to figure out what you can have a zillion different products designed to meet a zillion different uh no exactly yeah you know. that's what we're saying i mean i we didn't mention qis but 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 that is the other part of the representation of uh, trend following that appeals to a certain type of investor as well i guess institutional investors who can do that kind of uh swap with with, with, with a bank and and uh, are happy with kind of to, to try and customize it to, to, to their own requirements yeah yeah and look and i think i mean look financial engineering you, you raised the point about uh, principal protected notes. Financial engineering is alive and well, right? You now have ETFs that are using QIS products. Okay, you have usage funds that you use they use QIS products, right? So, you know, in all of these things, there's the underlying investment, 
And then there's all the structural engineering and everything else that goes on top of it. You know, when we launched uh, the ETFs we managed in the US five years ago, it, it, it has a number of limitations um, in terms of the way that it's set up and, and that are limiting for it. Um, and, you know, we're, we have spent a lot of time of, I've talked to people over the past year or two about like, and again, like this goes, again, it goes back to the narrative thing is because we go in and we want to sell people on our narrative and tell them, but you know, I can tell you that like the narrative that I tell people about what we do resonates with some people unbelievably well, and they're excited to hear about it. Other people, they don't want to hear it. Right? <laughs> Some people not, don't like the, the repetition. It's not narrative. interesting. Yeah. It's not interesting. Though. <laughs> so, so to me, the question is: is as much as we love selling our narrative, you know, it's a lot more interesting. It's having them tell you what they love. Yes. You know, yeah, like like yeah. what what what's the ideal product for you? If you could now, okay, don't throw out the eight percent a year, ten percent a year, never down year. Like 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 it's like I can't. I mean, but. Let's talk about that. And that that's like that's what I'm trying to do on even when they take me around the distribution side. Distribution people are there to raise money. Right. And the people on the other side know the distribution people are there to raise money. And so it it just makes people kind of defensive. What I try to do when I get in front of people is is to just God, can we can we just I mean almost the equivalent of like, let's just take take a take shots of a truth serum, Bill. What what would you like? Right. What's the product where you say, I wish I had that? I don't know if we can do that, but I can tell you about, about why we've done things the way that we've done. I can tell you about stories of talking to people who sound a bit like you, and maybe there's a way to line that up. But there's a very, very high probability that there isn't either. And so let's save each other a lot of time of running around and pretending that, you know, that, that, that you're, you're monitoring it or you, know, because again, and look, and this gets back to the human side of the business is that like one of the great advantages the larger players have with these long-term relationships with clients, it's hard to fire somebody you're friends with. You, I mean, right? I mean you've gone out to dinners, you hung out together, you, I don't know, shot pheasants together or whatever, whatever people do in the, in these relationships. And so, you know, like it takes a lot. One of the interesting things about an ETF that actually appeals to people. It's easy to fire the manager. No one, I mean, you, you try to get, you try to get out of, I'm just, look, I've been, I don't know, but I, I'm, you try to get out of a mutual fund, right? You submit your redemption request for $50 million. I hide your phone, right? <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> they are going to be, they are going to fly in. They're going to be all over you once they see that coming, trying to convince you to stay and putting every pressure under, under the sun. One of the, you know, I mean, I've had people tell me like, honestly, one of the things I like the most, you guys don't find out about it for two months. Yes. <laughs> and so, and so, so and, but, but that's okay. But so before we uh, wrap up, I, I just conscious of time, there was an article which I shared uh, from Bloomberg um, just earlier. You, you're speaking about financial engineering and uh, it's about how Acure and uh, Acadian and a few other firms are bringing back certain strategies that had been popular in, during the uh, pre-global financial crisis. And uh, the article mentions uh, the likes of um, return uh, stacking as well. But there's an interesting line in here somewhere. The line is, yeah, if you just sell an alternative strategy today, it's so hard to get anybody to care because the S&P is up 23%. So that's, the, I mean, uh, that sums it up. So the idea is, you know, to use, uh, we're, we're increasingly seeing 130, 30 type strategies. So where you lever up to 130% long and have a 30% short. And the article also mentions, um, obviously return stacking as, as another representation of this. So, I mean, is that something you're hearing again? It was certainly something that I heard a lot, maybe back in, you know, 2019 or so that people didn't want to give up on their beta to invest in an alternative strategy where the opportunity cost was deemed to be very high because you're missing out on, on the market return. Would you say that's uh, an important uh, consideration again in, in your experience? Well, look, look it's, it's brutal for anybody who's not in the S&P 500 when the S&P 500 keeps going up the way that it does. Um, but I also, like I mentioned before, that it's also the flip side of it is bonds, right? And I mean, bonds have been, you know, bonds are like the Voldemort of asset allocation right now. Like nobody wants to talk about them. But but you think about like every portfolio. If you don't have forty percent in bonds, you've got thirty percent in bonds with it. But like like literally every single portfolio has this as a cornerstone allocation. 
the performance of bonds this decade have been, um, if this was an active manager, we have been fired, right? I mean, you're, you, so, but remember bonds for 20 years were the Superman of diversifiers. Like it, if you, if you chart the Bloomberg ag over 20 years, it is, you, it is it, like a ruler. You draw a straight line from the left to the right. It has a sharp ratio of 0.9. It's liquid has a negative correlation to equities. It has a, uh, does 350 basis points more than cash and was, and had a max drawdown of 3.8%. L- literally nothing looked good relative to that. So, oh, and like, and, and the vol was like three or something or four. I mean, it was like ridiculously low. So yes, people always love to focus on their best asset at this time. But I think the broader issue is, so what have happened today? So you've had much larger than expected drawdowns in bonds, right? And one thing about financial history is it never goes away. You can't erase it. Every asset allocator is going to say, what's what's my drawdown potential in bonds? And it's always going to be 16%, not 4% or something. But the volatility has also gone up. So the, I think, and I, this is a, I, I'm, I've got to run this. And if anybody's listening to this, you know, run it before me and do a cool LinkedIn post. I think the vol of, of like corporate bonds in the U S may be higher than the SGCTA right now. Like it's, it's up into the, it's gone from four to eight or nine or 10 or something. I'm not sure. I, so, but so volatility has gone up right now. What does that mean? And you're, now you're building your models for the next 10 years. You can't pretend that bonds have a four vol. Um, now what's the return expectations over cash? You think managed futures having a bad year? Bonds are underperforming cash again. The third year in a row, not the second year in a row. Um, so I think broadly, in the broader asset allocation world, I think this shift from the ease of 60-40, where everything was working for you all the time, to something that looks like 50-30-20, is, is, is happening not because people know, you know, oh, now I know what, you know, my, I mean, I mean, look, there's a, an element of, like, Building models, asset allocation, everything else, there's an enormous amount of judgment and theater and art and, and narrative storytelling, et cetera, as much as there is science, right? I mean, so you take 30 asset classes, you've got to make how much is every one of them going to earn over the next 10 years over cash? What's the correlation between each of these asset classes? What's the volatility of each of these asset classes? And run it through a model, right? And then the model is going to be like, oh, give me all Bitcoin or something, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like, 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 I mean, the model is never going to give you an answer that you want. So you're like, okay, no, let's not do that again. So let's, you know, like haircut here, put parameters on it. Then you end up with something which is basically where you started with a lot of work that went into it. So, so the 60, so, so the transition to something is not correlated to either stocks and bonds, I think is very, very real. And the, then the question is, how do you convince people, at least from my perspective, how do I convince people that this asset class, you know, that eight out of 10 people have a bad, bad impression of, and, you know, and the other two probably had a bad experience. Okay. So, so like, like, how do you convince them that, that this should be there with infrastructure, you know, private credits, uh, uh, you know, private equity. And, and, and that's, uh, you know, look, I mean, I'll, I'll either get that right or I'll die with my sword in my hand on that one. I think part of the reason people are doing it, people are doing it because bonds weren't earning anything, right? And when bonds are earning more now, it, it's, you know, but like it makes perfect sense. This is a great asset class that's capital efficient. It makes perfect sense to put it on top of other things. The risk is that when you package it together, your skis are pointing in the same direction. You go through unexpectedly large drawdowns. And that's, and that, and that gets people, get, gets back to people's drawdown tolerances, which I think are less than people say that they are, which is why we haven't done it. Okay. Well, we're over time, I think. Um, so thanks for coming on again, uh, Andrew. Always great to get your perspective. Um, so next week we're back. Actually, Niels is back next week and he'll be speaking to me. So uh, if you have questions, send them in. Um, but in the meantime, stay tuned uh, for more content and we'll be back soon. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. 
we have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.